Irfan sir, please begin. Yes, sir. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. I am Dr. Dharmang Vyas, Assistant Professor at Parul Institute of Physiotherapy, Parul University, Vadodara, Gujarat. And today we are here to have a webinar with Dr. Juhi Bharnuke. She is a physiotherapist as a, working as an assistant professor in musculoskeletal physiotherapy at Lokmania Tilak College of Physiotherapy, Khargar, Mumbai. Her areas of interest is musculoskeletal physiotherapy, kinesiology, biomechanics, human movement sciences, and research methodology and scientific writing. She has won a lot of awards and recognitions as a chancellor medal for best postgraduate student for the batch 2015 and 17. She is a gold medalist in Masters of Physiotherapy at MGM Institute of Health Sciences, Navi Mumbai. Congratulations, ma'am, for that. She's a co-founder for South Asia Dance Medicine Science Association, a non-profitable organization which is working for musculoskeletal injuries prevention and performance enhancement of professional Indian classical dancers who are practicing and performing in India, Malaysia, and the United States. She has done more than 10 publications in national and international journals. She has presented more than 10 papers in national and international conferences, and she has contributed a lot towards research and her intellectual property are normative value for single leg squat in healthy Indian adults and normative value for Q angle in Indian females with knee osteoarthritis. Juni ma'am, congratulations for your achievements and we are honored to have you with us today on this platform where probably we will be enlightening our students and everybody who's attending the webinars with your immense knowledge. Thank you once again, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and joining us here. Uh, we can start with the presentation, Julie, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Dharman, for that elaborate uh, introduction of mine. And I'm really honored to uh, share with you the little information that I have about chronic pain with the students of Paril University. So uh, as Dr. Dharmang mentioned that my master's is in musculoskeletal physiotherapy and my elective has been pain management. So I decided to share some ideas about chronic pain management because that is one tough area for uh, physiotherapists to manage patients. So I will just share my screen with all. Is my screen visible? Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so understanding chronic pain, but before we go to that, uh, let me just uh, give a brief about why is it important to understand chronic pain and what is really chronic pain. So patients with long-standing conditions such as cancer, malignancies, tumors, with long-standing diseases like osteomyelitis, osteoarthritis, usually complain of chronic pain, which is for more than three years or so. Now, treatment and assessment of such patients is actually more just more than history and physical examination because it has a lot of biopsychosocial factors which are involved in it. So let us understand what is exactly chronic pain. By definition of International Association for Study of Pain, which is IASP, and that is the gold standard organization for pain management, it de defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, which is associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So there may or may not be a tissue damage, but it is a perception of an unpleasant sensory along with or accompanied with an emotional experience. The science of pain, pain is always a personal experience that is influenced by varying degrees of biological, psychological and social factors. It is beyond structural and tissue damage and often involves other factors as well. Pain and nociception are different phenomena. Pain cannot be inferred solely from activity in sensory neurons. Through their life experiences, individuals learn the concept of pain. A person's report of an experience as pain should always be respected. What this means is some people would have a low threshold 
foreign osteoceptor stimuli and can actually perceive pain quite quickly while there would be others who would have a very high threshold for pain and will not have that much of a pain perception even with a high nociceptor stimuli although pain usually serves as an adaptive role it may have adverse effects on function and social and psychological well-being verbal description is only one of the several behaviors to express pain inability to communicate does not negate the possibility that a human or a non-human animal experiences pain now uh, initially when the iasp was talking about pain and describing pain there were two major types of pain depending on the duration for which it a person has been suffering from it one was the acute pain and the other one was the chronic pain the cause for an acute pain usually a trauma uh, a dislocation an accident is known to an individual chronic pain the cause of a chronic pain is often unknown it may be vague and it may have an insidious origin which could be um, a couple of years ago the duration for which an acute pain lasts is usually very short it is well characterized and circumscribed whereas uh, a chronic pain persists for more than 3 months for up to 3 years the treatment approach resolution of an underlying cause the treatment of underlying tissue damage or structural involvement can usually be treated and the acute pain can be resolved however in chronic pain the underlying cause of the pain is so vague and often there are more than one factors or system that are involved which makes the treatment of chronic pain more challenging as compared to acute pain very of lately the concept of subacute pain has come into existence now what is subacute pain uh, it was seen that patients with uh, a recent trauma or injury present to you with signs of inflammation uh, redness rubber paler and all of these inflammation usually subside within 3 to 4 days or takes up to 7 days to 1 week to 10 days for it to subside a more severe or long standing pain which is chronic pain takes longer than 3 months to subside however there are a pretty handful amount of patients who lie in between the stage of tissue healing who don't fall in the stage of inflammation nor do they fall, fall in the stage of chronicity now these are the patients which show a mixed picture they do have a known cause of etiology they do have a etiology for their pain a source of pain a structure of pain however it is not actually acute enough to call them into the stage of inflammation now these uh, patients usually fall under the category of stage of proliferation or stage of tissue remodeling phase and they are characterized as patients with subacute pain i think most of us who read about physical examination uh, physiotherapy students who have followed david maggi would come across these types of pain as these three which is the acute subacute and chronic pain patients now in today's webinar we are going to discuss about why is it important to understand chronic pain most of the patients that walk into your opd or your clinic present with acute pain they come to you with a clear cut history of a fall an accident a recent trauma a surgery and you know what are actually the source of origin of pain okay they give you a clear physical examination your special test would come positive and you can pinpoint what is the exact location of this pain you know what examination to do what hypothesis to form and then you design your short term and your long term goals for the management of these patients in pretty 90 to 95% of the conditions you get a clear diagnosis for this condition the prognosis is uh, is something that you can define based on their condition however uh, it is important to understand the pathophysiology of a chronic pain because the out of the approach of looking at a patient with chronic pain is completely different this patient comes to you with multiple causes of pain this patient comes to you with a lot of superimposing complications okay which could be associated over the years this pain has been long standing so more than one uh, complication would have arise 
um, there could be multi-systemic involvement as well. For instance, if a patient with chronic pain had an injury to a joint or it could, the source of pain could be a bone or a joint, but over the course of years, because the patient was left untreated, now the source of pain could also have been the ligament, the fascia, the muscles, so on and so forth. So this is something that is a pattern which is prevailing in patients with chronic pain. Talking about central involvement, we all are aware about the musculoskeletal adaptation, the central adaptation of pain. Now, because of this central involvement, most of the adaptation to the pain uh, happens, which is also known as the central sensitivity. Uh, physical causes, there are also certain social behavior and contextual factors which have some role to play when we are talking about the management of patients with chronic pain. Social factors could be their activity limitation, their participation restriction because of this pain. Behavioral could be because this has been a long-standing pain. There could be uh, various factors involved in their own personality and personality trait towards dealing and coping with this kind of a pain. Contextual factors could also be uh, any comorbidities, uh, as discussed earlier, personality traits, which could have been inculcated because of this kind of pain. Moving on to the definition of chronic pain. Again, this definition is given by the International Association for Study of Pain, which is IASP. And chronic pain uh, is defined as pain of any etiology not directly related to neoplastic involvement associated with a chronic medical condition or extending in duration beyond the expected temporal boundary of tissue injury and normal healing. And it adversely effect, affects the function of well-being of the individual. Now here, if you carefully observe the definition of uh, chronic pain, it clearly talks about uh, no association or direct relation with a neoplastic involvement. Pain related to malignancy, tumors, cancers is often a completely different entity which is uh, dealt in a different manner because here we are talking about an ongoing progressive tissue damage that happens. Unlike other musculoskeletal or medical conditions which are long-standing and affecting the tissues. Chronic pain exerts an enormous personal and economic burden affecting more than 30% of people worldwide according to some studies. Chronic pain, uh, the loss of employment uh, because the patient mostly is off their work many, in many cases. So there is actually no active involvement in the, in the burden sharing. The cost of medications for these patients is also very high because they are taking some medications for a long term, uh, long time. Similarly, they are also going through some kind of therapy such as the cognitive behavioral therapy or the CBT, which has also been long-standing. So the overall cost of hospitalization, medical care, insurance, plus lack of employment during this period of time is actually quite burdensome economically and personally. And currently, as per the recent statistics, it's nearly affecting about 30% of the people globally. Chronicity of pain. Pain in its acute form enables to identify potentially harmful stimuli or dangerous situation. As discussed earlier, any pain, if it's acute, you're able to pinpoint what is actually the structure that is involved. As such, pain prevents contact with those stimuli and situation and protects the damaged tissues while it heals. Okay, so the first response of an acute pain usually is muscle guarding or muscle spasm. And that is a reflex protective mechanism to prevent the structure from getting damaged further. However, once the pain evolves into a chronic state, its adaptive nature is superimposed by negative sequels that have a massive effect on both the individual and the society. So if this patient is not uh, treated in the acute or the subacute stage, or rather neglected, or the patient does not himself or herself voluntarily approach for a treatment or a rehabilitation, many a time this patient lands up into a sequel of this pain and uh, very rightly called as a negative sequel and ends up being a part of the chronic pain syndrome.
Now, once the patient uh, enters the chronic pain syndrome, treatment and management becomes equally difficult. Chronic pain is recognized by the World Health Organization as a disease and is one of the most prevalent diseases worldwide, leading to substantial disability and enormous societal cost. Now, a pain in its acute and subacute stage is still considered as a symptom, but you can all observe that the minute this condition or pain reaches in, into its chronic stage or into its chronicity, it is no longer a symptom or a sign, but actually a disease. Okay, and it is recognized by the World Health Organization in 2011 that chronic pain is actually a chronic pain syndrome and it is classified as a disease. Now, let's see some important statistics here. Chronic pain is a pain that lasts for more than several months, whereas we defined as pain that lasts for more than three to six months. But usually it takes longer than a normal tissue healing. It's a very common problem. Results from 2012 National Health Survey, NHS survey shows that about 25.3 million adults, that is roughly 11.2% of people, had pain every day for the previous three months. Nearly 40 million adults, which is 17.6%, had severe pain. Individuals with severe pain had worse health used more healthcare and had more disability than those with less severe pain. Etiology or the cause of chronic pain. Most patients who suffer from chronic pain complain of more than one type of pain. Okay, So they will not come to you with a sharp shooting pain or a dull aching pain or a throbbing or a deep aching pain. They usually, one day they'll tell you that the pain is really vague. The next day they will tell you that it's radiating. The third day they'll be more like it's localized. You have one trigger point. So every day the presentation of symptoms would be varied. For example, a patient with chronic low back pain may also have fibromyalgia. So as discussed earlier, this pain started as a mechanical back pain, but only maybe for settle involvement. But over the course of time, as this pain was untreated, it resulted in involvement of the fascia and central sensitization of pain resulting in fibromyalgia. Now, this, this particular patient who comes to you with a low, which started as a low back pain, now also comes to you with fibromyalgia. So your treatment uh, approach towards looking at this patient has to be more holistic. Now you cannot be treating just his low back, but you also have to look after those trigger points in multiple areas of the fascia that have occurred due to the fibromyalgia. A significant percentage of patients suffer from a major depressive and generalized anxiety disorder. Over 67% of patients with chronic pain suffer from a comorbid psychiatric disorder. Now that's a very, very huge percentage stat. We are talking about 70% of people out of 100, 100 people with chronic pain syndrome, we are talking about 67 people actually having a comorbid psychiatric involvement. There are multiple categories and types of pain, including neuropathic pain, nociceptive pain, musculoskeletal, inflammatory, psychogenic, mechanical, and malignant. Now let's see each of these in short. The sources of chronic pain, the very most common cause of chronic pain is a neuropathic pain. Peripheral neuropathic pain as the case post-herpetic neuralgia or diabetic neuropathy. Central neuropathic pain after usually seen after stroke or what do you call as cerebral vascular accident, a CVS sequel. Neuropathic pain is also common in other conditions such as amputation. Very common after a limb amputation where the patient feels continuous um, gestational neuropathic pain along with what is also called as phantom limb pain. Phantom limb pain is also a huge portion of neuropathic pain. And these are the category of people that form a major chunk of the chronic pain syndrome patients. Nociceptive pain, pain due to actual tissue injuries such as burns, bruises or sprains. Now burns is another very uh, huge entity that needs a special actual segment uh, altogether if we talk about. So burns uh, injury, especially if we're talking about grade two or grade three burns, not just involves the superficial tissue, but also the deep layers of the connective tissue, 
there actually these nociceptor uh, pain receptors are lying so maybe talk about the pain receptors the pacinian corpuscles we are talking about the free nerve endings all of these nerve endings are damaged at the grassroot level in case of burns a burn tissue to heal usually takes a very long time and even if the connective tissue the skin is healed it's never completely back to 100% healthy tissue in this process of recovery from a burns uh, in a burns condition there is damage to these free nerve endings which results in a permanent deformation so suppose there were x number of nociceptors which are or pain carrying receptors which are present in the hand but post burn injury which was a deep a grade 2 or grade 3 burn it may have resulted in a damage of those nociceptors resulting in permanent alteration of pain perception the next category uh, or let's talk about the next condition in nociceptor pain is the sprains okay ankle sprains or ligament sprains are very common uh, in athlete and in sports population now along with the sprains what happens is there are mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors which are present in the joint but because of recurrent and repetitive ankle injuries or ligament injuries these um, proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors do get permanently altered and deformed resulting in affection of the afferent pathway which takes the nociceptor feedback to your brain the third and the most common category which we come across is musculoskeletal pain okay that is back pain and myofascial pain uh, spine pain usually uh, the patients who belong to spine pain either cervical or lumbar or thoracic or patients with myofascial pain usually escalate into a chronic pain syndrome very easily because spine is a structure which has a lot of uh, involvement or a lot of uh, what do you say influence of posture repetitive movement habits on it so if we are uh, talking about a spine pain more than 3 to 6 months we are also talking about the uh, demands of long postures we are talking about weight obesity comorbid factors addictions such as smoking so all of these result in a longer healing of back pain compared to other joints which are affected myofascial pain mfr is or myofascial pain syndrome mfs is a very common syndrome or a spectrum of syndrome that we see in musculoskeletal disorder now a fascia is actually a continuous structure throughout your body and affection of fascia in one part can give a refer or a trigger pain on the other aspect of or other part of the fascia so this type of pain musculoskeletal pain and its treatment takes longer than what is expected the next type of pain is inflammatory pain such as autoimmune disorders uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis patients come to you with cardinal signs of small joint pain early morning stiffness lasting for more than 3 to 6 months now in this patients it's not just the um the joints or the capsule which are affected or the nociceptors but there is an ongoing inflammatory process also if i am not mentioned on the slide but ankylosing spondylitis where we are talking about the mutation of actual gene hlab27 gene uh, and mutation of that gene resulting in inflammatory autoimmune disorder treatment of this pain not just involves um, your rehabilitation approaches your electrotherapy approaches but lot of it actually involves management of the underlying uh, medical condition next is inf infection infection in children and in adults like osteomyelitis osteomyelitis is a very common condition found in the children of indian subcontinent and treatment of osteomyelitis involves a very long term supplementation a long term uh, medical management at times even surgical management psychogenic pain pain caused by psychological factors such as headaches or abdominal pain caused by emotional psychological or behavioral factors now one common example of psychogenic pain is pain uh, in the abdomen in patients with anxiety disorders you may find it very hard to believe but patients with abdominal pain or stomach pain most of them without any underlying cause on an ultrasonography or on a surgery or endoscopy and there is no cause to be found such patients usually come under the category of anxiety disorders 
headaches or what we call as migraines or cluster headaches a recent study by international society of migraine has actually found out that cluster headaches or migraines 70% of them are related to emotions okay to stress to triggers so here there is no actual cause of your headache or the pain being triggered there is no actual um, pathomechanics happening up there but it's just a psychological response to the other factors the contextual factors the social behavioral and the psychological factors okay last but not the least malignant pain now this is a, a separate entity and it's a huge entity if we study malignant pain uh, is a pain which has a source of origin as a tumor okay expanding malignancy where there is a lymphatic spread of the cancer throughout the body this pain and why is it different from rest of the pain that we discussed earlier is because there is a con on continuous ongoing and progressive tissue damage which is often even worsened by treatments such as chemotherapy where there is um, a huge load of chemical uh, management medical management that's happening on the body this kind of treatment pain is not just challenging or difficult to treat but at times even impossible to treat okay a lot of adjunct therapies a lot of uh, meditation cbd uh, allied therapies have a huge role to play in the treatment of malignant pain moreover it has been seen that a person's own motivational level or will power is something that still stands or holds a very high place in patients who suffer from end stage cancer pain or pain due to malignancy or um, pain due to tumor now we this was just about the background of chronic pain now let us focus on what do you actually ask in a history and how do you examine a patient who is coming under the category of a chronic pain syndrome history and physical examination should include the onset of pain description mechanism of injury if applicable location which is the site radiation of pain whether it is radiating or no the quality of pain uh, whether the pain is nocturnal it has a diurnal variation whether it's more in the morning or in the afternoon the severity of pain factors contributing to the relief of pain that is the relieving of factors and worsening of pain which are the aggravating factors the frequency of pain or how continuous it is or how intermittent it is and any other breakthrough pain okay the verbal numeric scale or the vnrs or a numerical pain rating scale are some of the most common uh, measures to determine the severity of pain from 0 to 10 this tool is commonly used for pain intensity furthermore associated symptoms should be assessed such as muscle spasm aches temperature changes now these are the things which we don't record or uh, document when we are uh, assessing an acute patients or sub acute patients but when a patient with chronic pain comes to you a patient with neuropathic pain post amputation these are some of the points that you should definitely uh, have a checkpoint upon so it will be about different muscle spasm and aches any temperature changes or vasovagal changes excessive sweating in the hand or dehydration restrictions to the range of motion morning stiffness weakness changes in muscle strength changes in sense the finger skin and e chymosis whether the nails are brittle or whether you also have to check for the vascularity whether the how is the nail bed there is whether there is a sluggish or there is a immediate recovery after um, a nail bed examination you also have to check for clubbing icterus now all of these signs and symbols are extremely important to rule out when you are evaluating a patient with chronic pain in addition to the patient symptoms the significance of the impact of pain in day to day function should also be discussed as well as a review of the activities of daily living now here you have to understand that this patient is not coming to you with a pain that is there since say last week or they had a fall while picking up something from the top and they injured and they had a ankle sprain 
and they are coming to you, they have to get back to their work in 10 days. No, we are not talking about these patients. We are talking about a patient who has had an injury or a trauma or an infection more than three to or four years back or a year back. Okay. They have been trying various mechanisms. They have visited various uh, doctors, various institutions. They have been counseled a couple of times. They may or may not have family support. They would have lost their job. They would be not, uh, you know, participating in their hobby. They would be away from the favorite sport that they are playing due to this uh, pain. So it's very important to document all of these factors when you are taking the history of a patient with a chronic pain syndrome. It is important to understand how chronic pain affects the patient's quality of life. Is the pain impacting their relationships or hobbies? Does the patient find themselves becoming more and more depressed day by day? Is the patient being able to sleep throughout the night or exercise regularly? Can the patient go to work without any limitation? Are activities of daily living affected, such as the basic ADLs like bathing, toileting, dressing, walking, or eating limited or restricted? And as mentioned even earlier, sleep pattern. Um, it's very important to document how is the sleep in patients with chronic pain. Separately, a detailed neurologic examination on physical assessment should be completed as well as an examination of area of pain. So once you do a local examination of the area that is affected, also do a quick neurological screening to rule out any red flag. Older adults are a specific population that often identifies as suffering from chronic pain. The self-reporting of pain can be difficult in this population. Self-reporting of pain is essential for the identification and treatment of pain, while the inability to describe or communicate pain leads to under-treatment. Now, I'll just give you a simple example of patients that I come across in, in my uh, clinical practice uh, who are over the age of 65 and there has been a pain for more than three to four years. You ask them, uh, you know, sir or ma'am, how is your pain today or how is your intensity of pain today on a scale of zero to 10? And they will tell you my pain is 10 on 10 for the last five years. Okay. The patient comes to you walking, has taken an auto rickshaw and has come to you and he's sitting there for a while. He's climbed one staircase and he's walked to the OPD. You definitely know that a patient with a 10 on 10 pain won't be able to do that. Yeah, nobody with a pain that is 100% will be actually able to walk into your OPD um, and tell you that this is their status. So uh, what's actually their intensity of pain? You cannot uh, actually believe that it's uh, 10 on 10 just because they are saying it. That's why in chronic pain patients, it's very difficult to uh, report what is their intensity of pain. You cannot um, uh, blindly believe that the pain is pain. You may have to use variable to discuss density of pain. Often elderly patients describe pain differently than an average population, complicating the diagnosis furthermore. Instead of pain, an elderly patient may complain of soreness or discomfort. Many times you ask them, so a patient with a long-standing uh, rotator cuff injury, and you ask them, how's the pain? And they'll tell you that uh, the pain is okay. The problem that I am having is that I whenever I'm lying down on my right side, I am not able to sleep. It's giving me headache or it's giving me a pain on my arm. So you try to ask more and more their, their intensity. Okay, so That's the key in, in treatment or in assessment of patients with chronic pain. Now this is a, a model of chronic pain. Now let's see what is present at the center of this. The tissue damage, the tissue damage is right at the center where the actual structure was affected. The pain or the nociceptors which are present around this tissue, which are carrying the pain sensation to the higher center, thought processes or how they are 
receiving this pain sensation and tissue damage around this thoughts would be the emotion okay could be a personal loss of any family member could be a loss of employment all of these could add up to the emotional uh, factor or emotional influence towards looking at this pain the suffering okay could be the uh, the outcome of this pain they would have um, lost their job they would have had a failure in their examination okay that could be a suffering or a resultant of this entire cascade of pain and the various pain behaviors along with the outside environment the outside environment would be their peers or their colleagues or batchmates or the people in the society and how they look at the patient who is constantly talking about their pain moving on progression of a chronic pain now if you see uh, a normal tissue healing so there is a cause of there is a source of uh, injury there is a damage to the tissue you give provide some amount of treatment the tissue heals and it's back to the healthy tissue stage however uh, a progression of a chronic pain is usually like a vicious cycle it continues round and round okay uh, so there is actual tissue damage resulting in pain anxiety that pain is signal signaling the tissue damage and harm brain becomes more focused on the problem than the healing changes then they start taking place in the nervous tissue uh, predominantly in the cerebral cortex resulting in more anxiety and less movement you would have come across patients who have that pain for such a long time that they actually tell us tell you i'm not going to lift this object because that's going to this is going to increase my pain further or i have seen patients with back pain who come to me and tell me that i am not going to bend forward because my doctor had told me 6 years back to not bend forward okay now the doctor would have told you not to bend forward but only in your acute stage but this patient didn't follow up didn't get the right treatment and continued to follow that for last 6 years he didn't bend forward now this person not just will have a restriction in the forward bending range of motion in the lumbar spine but would also have a musculoskeletal adaptation right up here that if i bend forward my pain is going to come back the physical part can still be worked upon but the mental part of it the adaptation of it is going to take some time to break so this cycle or vicious cycle of progression of chronic pain continues a very uh, short overview on what is central sensitization central sensitization occurs through a process called as wind up leaving the involved part of the nervous system in a state of very high reactivity this high reactivity lowers the threshold for what causes pain and leads to maintaining pain even after the initial injury has healed so actual injury the baseline cause has healed completely but because of the high reactivity in the cerebral cortex or what you call as wind up there is a central sensitization that has been set up central sensitization is defined as an increased responsiveness of nocio receptors in the central nervous system to either normal or sub threshold afferent input resulting in hypersensitivity to stimuli any small stimulus can be perceived as pain even if a cotton okay whisk of cotton would be felt as a nocio receptor or painful stimuli responsiveness to non noxious stimulus is what i was talking about so simply they dip their hand in the water which is supposed to be or considered to be a very pleasant stimuli but they feel even dipping a hand in the water as a painful stimuli increased pain response evoked by stimuli outside the area of injury and expanded receptive field for instance they had an injury in the zone 2 of the hand but if you actually do a pin point and the forearm they will say no this is causing me a lot of pain please do not touch my forearm you know that there is no actual tissue damage at the forearm but because of the central sensitization of pain the area of the receptiveness has expanded so much that it has even reached the forearm neural plasticity plays a role in cellular changes with a demonstrable increase in both membrane excitability and synaptic eff efficacy now let's see at microcellular levels what is actually happening 
The effect of this process is recruitment of additional sub-threshold synaptic inputs to nociception, resulting in greater field of receptivity. Now, as you all can see, this is uh, your synaptic membrane. Okay. And this is the synaptic transmembrane. So there is increase in the number of receptors at the synaptic membrane, increasing the membrane excitability. Increase output of nociception. So more afferent feedback would be carried via the reflex arc. The effects of this process may persist beyond the duration of the initial noxious input, resulting in pain hypersensitivity to normally innocuous stimuli. Thought to play a role in affecting pain facilitation and inhibition, inhibiting the descending pathway, overactivation of the ascending pathway, and pain facilitatory pathway. So two things happen in the, uh, rather three things happen in, in, a, in a neural plasticity or a central sensitization. There is increase in the transmembrane excitability because of increased synaptic transmission, more number of receptors at the synaptic transmembrane. There is increase in the ascending pathway or pain facilitation. The descending pathway are depressed. So there is no reverse action potential that is generated to suppress this pain. So overactivation of the ascending and pathway and depression of the descending pathway. To put it all simply, it means that too many messages are going to the brain, but very few actions are taken or very few responses are generated by the brain to respond to these messages. So what happens when too many messages go to your brain? It's, it's just like too many messages going to your inbox and making your Gmail full or too many messages making the storage of your cell phone full. What would happen when you do that? Too many messages, too much of cluttering, and then you have to delete some of them. A brain is also a machine which knows what to selectively delete. Now, when deleting these inputs that are going, many a times the brain confuses on what to delete and what not to delete and often ends up deleting the good responses or the good stimuli. And over the course of time, the patient starts feeling more and more of nociceptor stimuli. Just the last, uh, as we come towards the end of the assessment, a brief over, overview of what is the chronic pain? What are the mechanism of it? We saw what history to take. What are the add-on points that you need to ask when you are taking the history? What is the physical examination you do? We also brush through the concept of central sensitization and neural plasticity. Now, let us all see how are you going to manage this patient? Because a lot has been talked about. A lot has been published. A lot of evidence about chronic pain. But eventually... Uh, what matters is how are you going to make this person with chronic pain feel better? How is he going to go back to his home or going to get discharged telling you that my pain has gone down from 5 to 0 or 6 to 2? Okay. So the primary concern is to first identify the red flag. Is the patient having a psychological involvement? Okay. Uh, now for that, you can have a PHQ or a a score of, of, you can say, the behavioral score, where you see whether a person is depressive, is suicidal, has major anxiety disorder. Now, these are your red flag patients. You need to um, involve a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and you have to go make them go through a round of CBT along with your rehabilitation protocols. Now, patients who, on, who do not have a lot of psychological involvement, you can totally target upon pain management. Now, pain management can be targeted towards improving the function, that is increasing their participation, decreasing the pain rating on NRS and VAS. And CBT can be involved once a week for improving their coping mechanisms towards dealing with this pain. This will result in improved function, decreased pain rating and better coping up. Now, another few things, uh, usually after surgery or after TKR, THR surgeries, what we report is how is the pain. But many a times in patients with chronic pain, you may have to document how is their motivational level. They may not be okay to come to your or walk into your clinic every day because they've been doing that for past so many years. 
so motivation plays a very important role and you need to document that from a scale of 0 to 2 0 to 10 every day when they come to your office a poor motivation rating uh, less than 7 or 8 and a good motivation is usually above 7 a uh, motivational interviewing or goal setting mindfulness activity pacing can be focused upon assessing the pain rather from 0 to 10 here you can talk about treatment of the actual uh, structure that is involved distracting them from their actual source of pain relaxed breathing exercise can be given and motor imagery is one more very uh, recently come up technique which can help in decreasing the pain in patients with phantom limb pain or patients with neuropathic pain you also have to assess uh, how is their coping mechanism so pain catastrophizing or acceptance many of these patients with chronic pain syndrome have a difficulty in accepting the fact that they have uh, you know a set mindset they will not tell you that uh, they will always tell you that i still have this injury my tissue is still not healed but they will have a very tough time to tell you that in you know that despite the pain is being treated it is the mindset it is the sense of sensitization that needs to be broken what really helps in this cases is actually showing them they are pre post evidence if you have an x ray or a mri or a ct scan or on physical examination a range of motion or a strength finding which has a pre and a post treatment evaluation to show look this is what was your condition and this is how your investigation shows this is what your radiograph demonstrates and this is how far you have come from where you started all of this will will help them to cope up their feeling of helplessness okay to give them some hope induce some contextivity and positivity all of these can be done at your level as a physiotherapist as a doctor by cognitive therapy you can do it at your level as well if if the patient does not fall in the red flag category or the suicidal depressive syndrome if they are falling into the next category that is the patients who are suicidal or having a, a, a depressive syndrome it is a straight referral to a psychiatrist for a behavioral health consult i think with this we come to an end of this uh, small webinar on chronic pain where i try to uh, overview or give a overview and brush through what is actually chronic pain why it is so underrated understanding a chronic pain and how is going to change your outlook of looking at patients who walk into your clinic with chronic pain it we also discussed about the phenomena of central sensitization the various sources resulting in chronic pain um the concept of uh, central sensitization followed by that we saw how to rule out the red flag what is history taking and how the physical examination will differ for this patient and very quickly we discussed about the management of this patient i hope uh, this particular webinar is helping you to go back to your clinical uh, clinics and help the patients who are suffering from this pain all the elderly geriatric populations who are walking to you with this pain for so many sessions months years now but still not getting that relief now here your role is more beyond giving them rehabilitation manual therapy electrotherapy treatings you just have to sit with this patients you have to talk to these patients write down about their motivation the contextual factors the societal behavioral factors and that's really going to bring down the pain and improve the function in this patient and i hope this session was helpful to you all and i look forward to continuing with more such sessions and stay connected with you all as and when to discuss about the various other aspects of pain management thank you so much for hearing me out uh thank you joey ma'am thank you so very much for enlightening us and all our students and everyone who is attending this webinar with your immense knowledge uh, thank you so much there was no better way to understand how pain affects a person as an individual and because we when we look at a patient our priority is always pain or the patient yeah. comes to us with pain uh, 
the patient will come to us very rarely with a decreased range of motion or any postural abnormalities or any right. other issues so the priority that the patient always has is his or her pain right and when we understand the basic physiology of chronic pain or when we understand or when we go into the depth of the pain we understand that why certain conditions does not resolve no matter yes. how good physiotherapy is given or no matter yes. how good medical attention has been given to that patient so Absolutely. thank you so much for enlightening us and letting us know into the depth of pain and uh, we will look forward for many such sessions from you ma'am uh, once thank again thank you on so much it's a pleasure once again on behalf of parun stuff physiotherapy parun university i thank you very much for accepting our invitation as a resource person for this webinar and uh, we will look forward for further sessions ma'am thank you so much thank you